think uh, with something like this, it obviously takes time and many people to produce it. And just before we start the presentation, I'd like to express a few thanks. Um, first of all, to our editors, Katie Ellis, who's in the room, and uh, Angie Hawke. Um, we've also recently had a very um, long interaction with the ODI communications team, and they've helped us hone our messages um, and also begin to interact with the media. Uh, it's been very helpful. Um, we've had a lot of reviewers review the work uh, over the period, and thanks to them. We have uh, also a large author group, um, as you will see, um, and uh, including contributions from uh, Action on Disability and Development and HelpAge International. Um, our financial supporters, uh, the German government, uh, here represented by Jörn Geiselman from uh, GIZ, um, thank you very much indeed for keeping with us during this project. Um, and also to Oxfam, who supported a little bit of work on Resilience Threshold, which we're not really going to talk about today, but is kind of somewhere there in the report, deeply buried. It's quite a big report, if you download it. Um, and to our panel members this afternoon, thank you very much for coming along and leading the discussion. Um, now I'm going to move straight into the presentation and uh, try and be get through it in time to allow plenty of time for discussion. Um, previous chronic, chronic poverty reports are very much focused on chronic poverty. This report uh, broadens the agenda and looks at what is required to get close to zero. We don't really talk about getting to zero, um, but getting close to zero. Um, this is the context. It's an international discussion that is going on. I'm sure you're all very well aware of that. However, the report is really designed to be useful to national level policy makers in developing countries, because those are the people who can really make a difference uh, on these issues as we go forwards. Thank you. <laughs> the key message of the report is that getting to zero, or getting close to zero extreme poverty, requires a new public policy approach to understanding and acting on poverty. And this is focused on tackling chronic poverty, on stopping impoverishment, and on sustaining people's escapes from poverty. By the way, we're, when we're talking about poverty here, we're talking about it in the conventional $1, $1.25 a day per person sense. Um, and we've got a, there's a, a slide on definitions, which we can come back to if you, if you want to, but I'm not going to say any more about that at the moment. In order to get close to zero, we need to deal with all three of these objectives. Um, and so the report proposes a goal, a way of framing uh, a goal to eradicate poverty, which relates to these three objectives. So it has, two, it has three targets. The first target, to promote escapes from extreme poverty until there is no more extreme poverty. The second target, that households are escaping extreme poverty, but they also continue on their upward trajectory. They don't just kind of stop at $1.26, um, or whatever the, uh, the poverty line is. And then target three, very important and quite neglected to date, uh, we need to stop the descent into extreme poverty so that the major risks and stresses uh, are managed. Extreme poverty is $1.25. That's the $1.25, yeah. yeah. So um, how are we going to know if we actually manage to achieve these objectives? And the report, we haven't got a slide on this here, it would be too detailed, but the report does propose a number of indicators uh, which we can monitor to see how well we're doing. So for example, on target one, the proportion and numbers of people crossing the extreme poverty line, the proportion and numbers of people who remain poor, who are chronically poor, the proportion of the poor children, women, older women and men, poor people with disabilities who are crossing the extreme poverty line. I mean, I could go on. There's, there are other indicators proposed, but those, those are a few of them. In terms of the second target, which is making sure that people who escape poverty continue on that upward trajectory, the proportion of numbers who've crossed the extreme poverty line who reach an upper poverty line. 
which is currently notionally $2 a day. Um, but you know, there might be country-specific definitions of that. And the third target, the proportion of numbers of people who are becoming poor, who enter poverty, um, and then reported impoverishment due to conflict, due to ill health, due to natural disasters, um, the major causes of poverty. Now, many of these indicators require panel data, that is, data, uh, household surveys which track uh, households or individuals over time. Many countries do not have that. There is a substantial need, therefore, for investment in new data, and this can be part of the data revolution which uh, has been talked about. The main focus of the report is on the policies to get to zero. And we argue that there are three sets of policies which we think work for all three of those legs of the tripod. Social assistance, the cash transfers, employment guarantees, employment schemes that we've become very familiar with uh, over the last few years. Uh, a massive investment in education, and we'll come back to that. And then a bundle of policies to support what we've called pro-poorist growth. And again, we'll come back to that. The social assistance, education will support pro-poorist growth, but there are other things uh, that need to be done, possibly minimum wages, provisions, inclusion of people working in informal employment in those, a very strong focus on smallholder agriculture, uh, and, and various other issues. Now, the pro-poorist growth uh, aspect is probably the most contentious in many countries, but social assistance is also quite contentious. Um, now, each leg of the tripod, those, those are three sets of policies that work for all three uh, aspects, all three objectives, yeah? Tackling chronic poverty, stopping impoverishment, uh, helping people continue with their upward trajectory, sustaining escapes from poverty. However, each of these legs requires another set of policies, which are more context-specific. So, for example, tackling chronic poverty may require implementing anti-discrimination measures in, case, in cases where chronically poor people are poor for long periods or poor for a lifetime because they are discriminated against. So discrimination may be one of the things that a country really needs to focus on if that is uh, something that is very strong in that environment. Uh, or, for example, measures to stimulate transformative social change, uh, which we'll talk about uh, in, a, in a while. And here I'm going to hand over to Chiara to talk precisely about tackling chronic poverty. Um, I have a strict instruction not, to, 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 not yeah. to touch it. Not to t oh, are we allowed to touch we it? We move the holder. We are allowed yeah. to touch yeah. it. I think I You're it. not allowed yeah. to take it out of its holder. Sorry, that's, that's right. the instruction. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Glad we've got that straight. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to make damages here. Okay, um, I will start just restating how important uh, social assistance is to tackle chronic poverty using the case of Brazil as an example where, as you know, Bolsa Familia, the conditional cash transfer program, contributed to half poverty between 2003 and 2008. And Brazil even updated, is updating Bolsa Familia to a more integrated um, program based on economic inclusion, so cash transfers um, accompanied by uh, employment creation for the poor and active search, so uh, methods to try to include as many poor as possible, making sure that everyone uh, is uh, reached by the program. Um, the other thing to say about social assistance in Brazil is that the case of Brazil tells us that um, to be successful in um, allowing graduation out of chronic poverty, social assistance need to be implemented in an integrated way with other types of intervention and it needs to be done in a systematic way, not as a standalone project that is done for a few months or a few years and then is left um, die. Now, um, Latin American countries are doing, have been doing very well with this, South Asian countries as well, with employment guarantees, with, you know, if, you think, if you think about India. Uh, the real challenge is with African countries. Although there is a case to be optimistic here as well, if, for instance, we take um, if we think of countries such as Ethiopia with the 
productive safety nets program. Um, now, I have a nice slide here. This is a life history diagram that we have uh, thought of using just because we, we have used, we use uh, life histories a lot in the report as um, evidence base. So this is a life history of uh, Amin from Bangladesh. You can't see the poverty line, but he has lived all of his life below uh, the poverty line. And this is here to remind us how social assi assistance by itself is not sufficient uh, to eliminate chronic poverty because chronic poverty is the outcome of different uh, factors, different uh, phenomena that act at different uh, levels. And speaking of causes of chronic poverty, we also find in the report that uh, loss of land, uh, loss of access to land is still one of the main causes of poverty and impoverishment um, across the world. Here in the graph you have, um, um, th this graph is telling you that uh, the poorest people in these five countries have been losing uh, ownership uh, of land between the 90s and the 2000s. And you can see that um, the percentage decrease in ownership is quite relevant. And again, this points towards the importance of uh, land policies in uh, tackling chronic poverty. So this includes um, uh, land reforms, reforms of land tenure, uh, programs to improve access to land markets for the poor, um, uh, helping the poor accumulating productive assets. We know these things, but uh, what we are saying is that these things are still very important and we need to take them really seriously. Um, now, loss of land, why is important to tackle chronic poverty? Because rarely um, small and marginal farmers and landless people have access to uh, alternative employment opportunities, or if they do, they're often uh, subject to exploitative labor arrangements. We know this. And so we know that growth, to be pro poor, what growth really needs to create jobs, create decent jobs. Um, and again, this is more easily uh, said than done, especially because many countries are um, struggling with very high rates of uh, informality and, and low economic rates, so it's difficult to do. But we do have examples of um, uh, cases of programs that can help uh, workers to have obtain a contract, even in the informal sector. This is um, the picture of Pamela, a um, girl from Malawi. She was involved in an ILO uh, vocational training program. And this, she, she was, um, she still is a um, domestic worker, but in the afternoon she is a carpenter. So through this program she was trained as a carpenter and she obtained a contract that was signed not only by her and her employer, but also by the local, um, by the chief of the village and the, I think the district officer. So this agreement was somehow made in front of other people uh, in order to guarantee its enforcement, although in a sort of informal way. Another thing that can be done to um, help workers in the uh, informal sector is provide services for migrant labor. Uh, in this case, we can think of migrant labor in Bangladesh and India. We know that migration is a pathway out of poverty, uh, but we also know that in some circumstances for many people, um, it is also, it's not a way uh, out of poverty. On the contrary, it can lock people into, again, <laughs> exploitative labor arrangements. And things that can be done are, for instance, um, helping migrants to have access to services both at the source area and um, at the destination area. How you do that, for instance, uh, providing them with an ID card. Um, so very simple things, but and we, we do have examples of things that can be done um, to improve the situation. Um, on chronic poverty, there are two other things that 
I wanted to mention that we discuss, we, we draw attention to in the report. And our, these are social norms and intersecting inequalities, and in particular what we want to draw attention uh, to is the fact that these, uh, these aspects are not um, yet taken too seriously in terms of uh, policies, that we do know that these are problems that the poor face, but we do not have sufficient solutions for this. And uh, an example is a clear example of social norms that in can impoverish is um, social norms that concern uh, inheritance by women. So here you have an extract, for instance, from a life history uh, by Halima, a woman <coughs> from Bangladesh who has been denied access to her inheritance, what she inherited from her husband, the land that she inherited. Um, so she's locked in poverty without having been access to, to this. And we, we know that inheritance reform is a very complex and contentious business um, that can be on paper, that can be done on paper, but then the practic the actual implementation requires much more than uh, legislative reforms, requires some s um, social and political mobilization that involves really uh, local actors um, and, and the civil society. Um, one last thing about um, chronic poverty. Uh, um, so about um, intersecting inequalities. Uh, the analysis that, that we did in the report on intersecting inequalities uh, draws from the work done by Naila Kabir and from another report on intersecting inequalities that is going to be published here at ODI. Um, and what we find is that, again, we have cases of successful can of countries that have successful reduced the intersecting inequalities faced by certain groups of people, um, so um, religious minority or ethnic mi minority. And some of these examples of these successful countries are Brazil, Ecuador, Ethiopia, Nepal, and India, for instance. And how they have done so is through a combination of the um, model that you see here, that it's a combination of political change, constitutional reform, increased political participation, um, a combination of universal and targeted or affirmative actions, and, and again, social mobilization. Now, this sounds very abstract and very hard to achieve, um, I know, and, and ov obviously each country will, um, will have context-specific version of this model. But we do find, um, as I mentioned, we, we have found examples of countries that have actually done this. Uh, and one good example is Nepal. Um, Nepal has had, throughout since the 90s, a um, uh, non-contributory pension system that has worked in helping to prevent poverty for um, old age people and widow women, but really the, the turnaround uh, came in 2006, 2007, first with the peace agreement and then with, this, with the constitution that really focused on implementing and providing um, affirmative action and inclusive policies. And, and this really have uh, made some advancement uh, possible. Um, now I'll go to the second leg of our tripod, that is uh, stopping or preventing impoverishment. Um, so what we, what we have found in the analysis that we have done for the report is that um, for 14 countries for which we had panel data, we found that uh, descents into poverty were almost as frequent as escape from poverty, really pointing out towards the fact that to get to zero poverty is really not enough to tackle chronic poverty. So to bring people up to the poverty line, 
we also need to prevent people from getting impoverished. And this is true for people who are already poor. So you know, prevent to get them even poorer than what they are. And also for non-poor people, people who are just above the poverty line from uh, falling, be falling below. And this is something that needs to translate into policy making. So um, it is really necessary that uh, policies are uh, adopted to prevent negative shocks on one side and on the other side help families to cope with these negative shocks when they uh, take place. Um, and here I think I have another life history, yes. Um, this is just to show you how impoverishment, you can see the downward trajectory um, <coughs> of Emanuele uh, from Tanzania, where impoverishment here was the outcome uh, of a combination of individual shocks and uh, economic vulnerability. Um, and this points towards the policies which are needed to prevent impoverishment, which are obviously context specific and depend on the type of risk uh, that we are talking about. We distinguish between individual and uh, systemic risk. Um, I'm just going to mention one example from, from each type of risk. So we, we know that ill health is the main cause of impoverishment pretty much everywhere. And ev now everyone is saying that countries should really aim towards universal health coverage. And again, the good news is that there are many cases of countries that have managed to do this or to move towards this. So we have the case of Thailand, for instance, that recently has managed to achieve universal health coverage but also of poorer countries, for instance, Burundi, which are moving towards universal coverage, for instance, providing uh, free services at the point of delivery for specific target, um, targeted of people, so pregnant women and, and children. So it, the good news here is that it is feasible. Um, it can make a big difference. In terms of systemic risk, the, ex the example that I wanted to mention is uh, disaster risk management. For this, we have drawn from our previous work uh, here at ODI on the geography of poverty. And on disaster risk management, we find that um, the ability to implement it really varies across country. And there isn't a strong correlation with income. So it's not necessarily the case that richer countries are better implementing it. It's more that uh, countries that are good uh, have, bec at it, have become so following some sort of turnaround in uh, commitment by the government to do disaster risk management. So the trick is to find this turnaround possibly not being a, an actual disaster. Um, and the second thing um, that we find is that disaster risk management focuses a bit too much on, well, not too much, it focuses a bit almost exclusively on, sa on saving life and not enough on, on saving livelihoods and, and, and saving um, and preventing impoverishment. Um, then I think I've come to the third leg. Mm -hmm. I hand it over to Andrew. So the third leg. Uh is about sustaining those escapes that people have been making. Um, and the analysis that we ran for this report uh, found that many people slipped back into poverty having once escaped. Um, some of these movements may be quite small up and down over the poverty line, but the graph, I think, uh, also captures at least some of the bigger movements, longer-term movements that are there. So this graph is a little bit complicated. It shows what happens at time period three to households that escaped poverty between time periods one and two. So this is from panel data, household surveys, that, that have three points in time where they track the same households and interview the same households and, and track their welfare and so on. 
So, uh, for example, um, even in some of the south more successful Southeast Asian economies, you still have uh, a fifth of households falling back into poverty once they've escaped. But this goes up, you can see in, in Uganda, over 40% in rural Ethiopia between 99 and 2009, a rather surprising finding, um, over 60% of households that had escaped uh, during a previous period, uh, over that period, um, were falling back. Um, I mean, I think that's, that may be explained by a particularly bad year in Ethiopia, and obviously with surveys, you're at the mercy of the year in which the survey has been done. But it does indicate there's a tremendous variety in the extent to which, just as the previous graph indicated variety across countries in the relationships between people becoming poor and people escaping poverty, here also there is quite a lot of, quite a lot of variety. But these graphs, I think, illustrate how panel data can help to get underneath the, the sort of normal um, uh, poverty data that you tend to see, which, which just looks at one point in time uh, survey data. Now, if you then look at uh, the factors that are associated with uh, staying out of poverty, this gives you a bit of a heads up about the policies that are relevant. Uh, again, um, education comes up uh, very frequently, for example, in South Africa and Uganda. <coughs> Land policy is also important. Um, as people stay out of poverty, they are continuing to accumulate land or they have uh, secure access to land. But then a variety of other things, um, remit remittances seem to be important, improved housing, local infrastructure, uh, and local, local development. Um, we've mentioned education uh, a number of times, and I suppose that if there was a leading policy that I, this is my personal view now that if I had to choose a leading policy area to focus on, it would be education. Um, it's not just basic education, which the world has really focused on, which gets households out of poverty. In, um, in most societies, children need much more than this. The poorest children need to be seen through school with the help of scholarships, cash transfers, school feeding programs, an appropriate and good quality education. And wherever possible, parental involvement in education. It's, it's a very big agenda, the education reform agenda. And the kind of uh, investment which China has made in, invest in, in education is absolutely massive when you compare it with uh, the, the investment that many other countries are currently making. So there is, there's a need for a, a paradigm shift, a, um, a complete hike, I think, in, in the, in the um, levels of investment in education. Linking education with the labour market is an incredibly important area in terms of providing people with the incentives to stay in school and parents with the incentives to send their kids to school. It's a very problematic area. Tr training, uh, a vo vocational education, uh, technical education is something that is, is, is a, real, um, a really difficult area proved very, very expensive indeed. Uh, it's remained very exclusive. It's not inclusive. Poor people hardly get access. There's some talk now about some successful uh, modernized apprenticeship schemes. Perhaps there's, there's scope for progress there. But there's a great need for policy creativity in this area, as well as the massive uh, investment that is required. Um, this sawtoothed progress uh, upwards, you know, beyond the poverty line, is a fairly typical example of how people progress. There are risks which have to be managed along the way, but this particular person, Munir, in uh, Bangladesh, um, has an agricultural story, hard work, combined with prudent investments in land and uh, technology, um, and managing the risks that, that come along the way. The report, the last section of the report, really asks the question, can it be done? I mean, it's we are talking about quite a, an ambitious agenda here, to put it mildly. And we've tried to answer this in two ways. We've tried to identify countries that have, had, that have been successful, and we've got a number of middle-income countries, not surprisingly, but there are also low-income countries that have made significant success uh, in, in tackling chronic poverty. Um, and Chiara has mentioned some of them uh, earlier. We've done projections to 2030, and this is the, the table that's uh, on, the, on the screen now. 
um, using the international futures model, and we can, we can talk about that uh, afterwards if you want to. The best projection from the calculations that we've done to date gives uh, 624 million people still in extreme poverty in 2030. The range is between 400 million and 950 million. This is not too far away from other projections that have been made, although it's a little bit more pessimistic. Um, the details are actually work in progress. The, the model is about to go undergo um, an upgrade. A, a large amount of more recent information is about to be incorporated. The World Bank is about to revise its, um, its uh, PPP estimates. Uh, and that will make uh, lots of difference, uh, lots of difference, well, could make difference to the, to the figures that come out of the model. But nevertheless, the, the, the modelling that we've done makes the point, I think, that it's going to be a difficult road lying ahead. Just uh, a couple of points um, to, um, uh, which have been quite controversial uh, in the discussions of that, the, that have been around various projections. You know, is poverty in 2030 going to be in today's low-income countries or in the middle-income countries? Well, it's pretty evenly split when you, um, according to the results we've had, um, at a dollar twenty-five. If you look at severe poverty, seventy cents a day. Um, not surprisingly, you find uh, most of that in today's low-income countries. The division between fragile and non-fragile states, uh, again, pretty evenly split um, there. And I'm just going to leave you with uh, a map we, which we've created, an index of vulnerability to poverty in 2030, which highlights in red the countries that uh, you know, are, are really going to be struggling in orange, uh, a next tier of countries. Um, in conclusion, we think the report presents a realistic picture of the road towards uh, zero extreme poverty. There are grounds for optimism but perhaps there are more grounds for pessimism. The widespread severe poverty in Africa, for example, the structural inequalities in South Asia, the state fragility which cuts across both of those. The report has made a case for a new approach which gets away from the expectations that either growth or human development or democracy or, for that matter, social assistance by themselves will do the job and tries to get under the bare statistics of progress to focus on what happens to people over time. And thank you very much for listening. Very good. Thanks very much.